There's a key thing, guys, that we want you guys to realize. There is no greater claim in the Christian faith that faith than that of the resurrection. There's no other religion that supports these type of beliefs, right? The central claim of Christianity hinges on the fact of whether Jesus rose from the dead. But we need to examine this from a very um, forensic aspect. We need to make sure that there is solid evidence to support this. So we know that the resurrection is mentioned over 300 verses in the New Testament, and almost all major theological points have res roots in the resurrection. And it is the center of practices of the church, whether that's baptism or communion. Those, those things are founded upon the resurrection, right? And 20 times we are told that we will raise, be raised from the grave like Jesus. And we also see that reference many times in Revelation, where we see the saints assembled around the throne of God. So the resurrection of Christ has been called the linchpin of the Christian faith. If Jesus really did rise from the dead, this provokes powerful evidence, number one, that his claims are true, right? If he's the only person that has conquered the grave, we need to listen to him, right? That means he can say that he is the Son of God and he is the Messiah, right? But if a skeptic could refute the resurrection, he claims would be off the hook with God as the idea of this resurrection altogether. However, there is a wealth of historical, philosophical, archaeological um, evidence that supports that he rose from the dead. So I'm very passionate about this specific doctrinal and apologetic aspect because of how crucial it is to our faith. And today we're going to talk about the abundance of the evidence that is there. And as we go through this, as, as we often find when we're talking doctrine or apologetics, we're only going to be going through the tip of the iceberg, just the tip of the iceberg. <clears throat> Gary Haber, I think it's Gary Habermas is still working on a book about the rest, solely about the resurrection and the, from the doctrinal to the historical, to the philosophical viewpoints. It's an academic book, which if you know anything about college books, they're, they're a dry read, right? Lots of information, not a lot of storyline. And I believe it's targeted to be 1200 pages as an academic book, just for reference. This is a uh, Wayne Grudem systematic theology, which we reference to awesome. And this one, this one has almost 1200 pages in it. And this is doctrines of the Christian faith. Gary Habermas, his book is going to be um, 1200 pages likewise, just on the resurrection. So first of all, as always, let's open with a word of prayer. Uh, my brother, Dan from the frozen tundra, would you open us in prayer, please? Father God, we thank you for this time today to, to learn more how to defend what, what you've been teaching us and what the, our whole faith hinges on. Father, we pray that you open our ears and open our hearts, open our minds. We ask your anointing on, on Curtis. Speak these words into us, Lord. Help us so we can help others. That's what you sent us out to do. Thank you, Father. Bless this day. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So why is the resurrection important? Well, let's turn in our Bibles to 1 Corinthians 15, verses 12 through 19. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 19. And I'd like to find a volunteer. Let's make this interactive right off the bat. Who would like to read that for us? I'll read it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you see that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, 
then our preaching is in vain. Your faith is also in vain, and your, your faith also is vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men, we are of all men most to be pitied. Oh, wow. That's a strong. Thank you, Morelli. Thank you. That's a huge emphasis from the Apostle Paul. And in verse 13, let's look at that. If Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, worthless. It's empty. It's void. It's meaningless. If Christ did not raise from the dead, there's no point for us to go to church. It's a country club. There's no reason for us to study a book because it's dead, it's void, it's empty, and it's lifeless. And worst of all, we are still trapped in our sins. So Paul here is underscoring the resurrection as the linchpin of the Christian faith. So um, there are those who say that even without the re resurrection, Christianity has significance. They hold that Christ's teachings provide ethical guidelines for humanity and the New Testament, however, testifies that this is not the case. Without the resurrection, clearly there is no meaningful uh, Christianity. So why does Paul call the resurrection of Jesus the very linchpin of the Christian faith? All right. So why do you guys think that? Why does Paul call the resurrection of Jesus the linchpin of the Christian faith? Because it gives us faith. It's proof of our faith. Very good, Pat. Yeah. Because it, it's on the resurrection that everything is hinged, is hinged on. Amen. Amen. And if we just are going to be cleansed from our sins and end up for food for worms, that's not a whole lot of hope, is it? Right? Right? We, we want to be sure that we have something that gives us encouragement that there is more to life than just this fleshly feeble body that that uh, quickly withers away, right? So if Christ is not risen, our faith is futile, devoid of force or truth, success, results, it's, it's useless, right? And if we're still in our sins, there's no forgiveness that has been granted for anybody's sin. And if that's true, we're lost to death, damnation, and hopelessness. That's serious, right? It also says that those who have fallen asleep in Christ is as if they died with their faith in Christ as the Messiah had perished. So Abraham, through Moses, through all the Old Testament heroes, they perished foolishly uh, because they hoped in a false Messiah. So if Christ didn't re re resurrect, we are the most pitiable of all people, right? Because if our hope is in Christ is limited to this life, Christians should be pitied above all people. But also the contrast is true as well. If, if that is true, we are the most blessed of all people with the most purposefulness in our life. Amen? All right. So the next question, why is it important today? Well, so much false doctrine, even within the church, you know, it's, it's hard to, we're always apologizing for, you know, other leaders, you know, we know about Robbie, about Zacharias, very disappointing, but, you know, like Bob, he was an excellent teacher and uh, God used him, so, but it's, you know, when you get these horrible things on Facebook from your non-believing friends, you know, it's like tearing at your faith. You know, like, how do you answer back? I understand, but they don't. Mm -hmm. And what? And Pat, it's a great point. What are they doing? They're looking at man, 
right? And everyone in the Bible fell. They all stumbled, all of them except for one, and that was Jesus. And he had the upper hand because he was also God. So, you know, right? If we start expecting man to act like God, we're going to have some problems with our faith, right? Right. Well, so what, I saw some good on, you know, Christian TV this week, and I was talking about David fell, Moses fell, everybody, you know, through the Bible has fallen. It all depends how you end your life. You know what I mean? And I pray that he did ask for forgiveness, you know, because it was um, a lot of good work there. I mean, we all followed Robert Zachariah's teachings. He was very good apologetics. So, you know, so. Um, can, I, can, I, can I add to that? Um, uh, it's easy nowadays to, um, you know, to, to find time to waste or to kill time, as, as people say. And I feel like, I feel like um, when it comes to faith, it's very easy as a Christian to, uh, to get consumed by the world based on the, the busyness of our schedule or whatever flashy goes on um, in the news. Um, but then we turn into these lukewarm Christians. Like, I will admit, I've, I've been in my past. And um, lukewarm Christians, as, as it says here, even, even Christians, those who believe in Christ, um, but don't believe outside of this, this life and this world, um, and don't have that faith, they're to be most pitied. So does that mean that a person who has never encountered uh, Jesus Christ or doesn't even know is more worth or maybe perhaps more has more potential uh, to God. So I don't know. It's almost like the prodigal son. You celebrate the prodigal son uh, even more so than the person who, who has been, you know, tr trudging in the trenches for a long time. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's very, yeah. Dan, very good. It's easy to get caught up keeping our focus to the left or to the right. When we're supposed to be looking at who, right? We're really big fact against other religions and faith. That's very true. It's very true. Good point. Good point. So, and you know, I think for me, one of the key things, the key elements of this is that um, Jesus is coming back. You know, we he resurrected. And think about when he ascended, what did he say to the apostles? Go make disciples. So he gave us stuff to do. He said, go make disciples, teaching them, you know, as I commanded you, and to baptize them. And he said, I'll come. But the angel said that he will come back as he left in the clouds. So he's coming back. And that's one of the things that is most exciting about the resurrection because it's just a stepping stone in the journey of our faith. Because as he returns, we have that promise that we too will be resurrected, right? Okay, now, uh, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. That is the big takeaway. Big takeaway. Patricia, the person who knew Jesus walked, you know, what was that? Let's see. That's, we're saying the person that walked away is like worse than the person who never accepted Jesus. But then you go to the point is, did they really know Jesus to start with? We're talking about worship leaders. You know, I'm not talking about Zachariah right now. And, of course, only Jesus knows hearts. Yeah. You know. And, um, Thank you, Pat. That's that's kind of what I was trying to say, very long-winded. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. It's both good. Both good. And Morelli has a good point, too, about it being relevant for today because of other religions and faith. Our God, the, the, the difference between Christianity and all other major religions is our God came down to earth and did what we couldn't do. All other religions try and work their way up to God. But if God created the heavens and the earth and he's perfect without sin, that's something none of us could do. Right. So that's a key point connecting. And one of his proofs was the fact that he overcame death in the grave. Amen. All right. That gets my blood pumping. Okay. So why do we need to know about this? Well, you know what, Miss Pat, who is always prophetically, we have heresies. We have heresies. And we're going to talk about this. We also have misinformation. We have these um, 
inerrant views and theories that are out there that are seriously misguided. We also have worldly wisdom. We're going to talk about that. Although they seem contrary, it's actually a biblical perspective on the unbeliever. We're also going to talk about a critical loss of reasoning. For some reason, skeptics refuse to look at the information with a forensic mindset, with a scientific mindset. As strange as that is, they, they do so. So first, let's talk about heresies, right? We're going to talk first about some ancient ones because we're going to see that those connections come from the past into the, the front the, today's time. So first is adoptionism. And this heresy denies the pre-existence of Christ and therefore denies his deity. It taught that Jesus was simply a man who was tested by God, and after passing the test, he was given supernatural powers, and he was adopted as a son, right? And, the, and this is, the thought was, this occurred at his baptism, right? So Jesus was then rewarded for all he did by his own good works, right, and his perfect character and his own resurrection and adoption into the Godhead. So what religion does that sound like today? This was second century, as you can see there, but what religion today has a very similar perspective? Um, uh, it reminds me of, of Islam when they say Jesus Christ could be a prophet or a saint. Yeah. But I'm not 100% I'm not sure. No, you're good. There's more than one, right? Very good. Who else? Mormonism. Mormonism. Very good, Dan. Because in Mormonism, if you do a good job, you can be a god of your own universe, right? Mm -hmm. Act right now. It's against two knives. I'm just saying, right? So we have that, that connection too. Okay, next we have docetism. This heresy was coined from the Greek word dokesis, which means to see. It taught that Jesus not only appeared to have a body and was not truly incarnate, Docetists believed that matter was inherently evil and therefore rejected the idea that God could actually appear in bodily form. By denying Jesus truly had a body, they also denied he suffered on the cross and rose from the dead. So they think he's this mystical, uh, ethereal being that came down and appeared to be human, right? And then he appeared to die on the cross and he appeared to be resurrected resuscitated after the resurrection. Well, what's the problem with that? The Bible refutes that. The Bible, we're told specifically that he he knew our sins. He We have a priest who understands who we are and what we have suffered, right? So docetism did not work in second century. Now, next is Apollinarianism. Say that three times really fast, okay? Apollinarianism. This heresy designed the true and complete humanity of Jesus, right? Because it taught that he did not have a human mind. It's almost kind of the antithesis of, you see that people are separating the spiritual from the physical, from the deity as we go through here. And this is an example. But instead he had a mind that was completely divine. So his mind was completely divine. Uh, this heresy lessens the human nature of Jesus in order to reconcile the manner in which Jesus could both be God and man at the same time. So they were, I mean, admittedly, they were trying to wrestle with the concept of the Trinity. It's just a short-sighted, errant view of what that is. And then the next one is Arianism. Arianism. This heresy taught that Jesus was a creature who was created and begotten of the Father. Only God, the Father of the unbegotten, so in this view, only the Father is truly God, only the Father. He was too pure and perfect to appear on earth, so he created the Son as his firstborn creation. The Son then created the universe. God then adopted Jesus as a Son, because after all, Jesus and God are not supposed to have the same nature in, the, in this view. And Jesus was worshipped only because of his preeminence as first of all creation right so that we this this one is the big one the, the the arianism is the big one but see the date where it started the fourth century but what religion does this sound like today
atheism. Really? I was going to say Jehovah Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses. That's right. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus was the firstborn creation. But this doctrine was refuted in the fourth century. We're talking 1,600 years ago, and we've had enormous amounts of, of theological understanding and a growth of, of uh, our doctrine and why we believe this. So it's kind of it's sad, actually, that the Jehovah's Witnesses and, and those individuals still cling to those truths because they've been refuted from multiple angles, right? Also, as a side note, Unitarians have embraced a view of Jesus very similar to this, uh, similar to Arianism, very similar. Uh, misinformation, that's our next category. Number two, misinformation theories. The, some of these are still floating around there today. Number one, the wrong tomb theory. Oh my gosh, my GPS was off on my phone. Google Maps was wrong. When I went to go look up for that tomb, I walked back and lo and behold, I guess I picked the wrong tomb, right? Proponents of this argument state that according to the gospel accounts, the women visited the grave early in the morning while it was dark. So due to their emotional condition and the darkness, they visited the wrong tomb, right? Overjoyed to see that it was empty, they rushed back to tell the disciples that Jesus had ridden, arisen, and the disciples in turn ran to Jerusalem to proclaim the resurrection. So <clears throat> there are several major flaws with this explanation. First, it is extremely doubtful that the apostles would have not corrected the woman's error if they were in error. The Gospel of John gives a very detailed account of them doing just that. And the tomb site was not known, uh, was known not only by the followers of Christ, but it was also by their opponents. There was a Roman legion surrounding it. Is it, it isn't like, um, hey, wh where'd you put the tomb? I don't, I don't know, where was it? Was that left of Gethsemane or right to the sheep's gate or to the north of the fish gate? Right? They knew where it was, right? The Gospels make it clear that the body was also buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. That's important because he was a wealthy, well-known individual. He would have most likely have had a more elaborate and more detailed uh, tomb in preparation for his own. It was a, like a family mausoleum tomb kind of thing, right? So it would have been well-known by the community, right? Um, if, and, and simply, if this is true, um, the authorities could have simply gone straight to the tomb, produced the body, and marched it down the streets. Boom, drop the mic, it's over, all right? That's all they had to do. If the tomb, the wrong tomb, sorry, was empty, all they had to do was to produce the body, all right? Remember, the preaching of the resurrection began in Jerusalem, less than 15 minutes away from the crucifixion site in the tomb, walking distance, 15 minutes. This factor makes this th theory extremely, extremely weak. Second is hallucinations. Um, although some of us who have a sketchy past can relate to hallucinating, but that's a different story, all right? Um, there is a hallucination theory, all right? The second theory holds that the resurrection of Christ just occurred in the minds of the disciples as a shared hallucination. And uh, in Dr. William McNeil, articulates this position and says the Roman authorities in Jerusalem arrested and crucified Jesus. But soon afterwards, the dispirited apostles gathered in an upstairs room and suddenly felt again the heartwarming presence of their master. This seemed absolutely convincing evidence that Jesus' death on the cross had not been the end, but merely the beginning. The apostles bubbled over with excitement and tried to explain to all who would listen that had happened. All right? That's his view, right? This position is pathetically unrealistic for several reasons. In order for hallucinations of this type to occur, psych, uh, psychiatrists agree that several conditions must exist. However, this situation where they were in fear for their life was not conductive to hallucinations. And hallucinations generally occur to people who are imaginative, right? Not just fishermen, right? I don't know that there's been great works of liturgy, liter, um, uh, works of art by those that are fishermen. There are exceptions, I'm sure. But however, the appearances of Jesus occurred to a variety of people in in multiple places, and some of them were even skeptics, right? 
Doubting Thomas is one of them. But uh, no two, here's the thing. Clinically, there has never, zero, ever in recorded history been an example of people having a shared hallucination. Let that sink in. Anyone who tries to purport this, they actually have already created a miracle of sorts. Because if it were true, if it was true as an explanation, then God used and orchestrated the only documented shared hallucination in history, right? So <laughs> I like that, Dan. Bad fish? That's right. Hey, oy vey, you get a little bad tuna, the tummy goes bad, right? All right. Now, if some continue for this position, they still must account for the empty tomb. Don't forget, there's an empty tomb. And we discussed that. We already knocked that off of our list, right? So if the apostles dreamed up the resurrection at their um, preaching, all the authorities, again, needed to do was produce the body, and that would have ended the apostles' pipe dream, so to speak. Get the connection, pipe dream, hallucination, just saying. Okay, moving on. All right, the next one is the swoon theory. The swoon theory. This third theory espouses that Jesus, he didn't really die on the cross but he was really tired, he passed out, and he was mistakenly considered dead, right? That is, Christ didn't die on the cross, but he later resuscitated. And after three days, he revived, exited the tomb, and appeared to his disciples who believed he had risen from the dead, right? The idea that Jesus never really died on the cross can be found in the Quran, which was written in the 7th century. In fact, um, some of the Muslims contend that Jesus actually fled to India. And to this day, there's a shrine that supposedly marks the real buried place of Jesus in Kashmir. And also, in uh, ascribing to this theory is the Da Vinci Code heresy, where Jesus fled to France with Mary Magdalene and had children, right? So there, there are people that try and ascribe to this fictional view of the, 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 um, the swoon theory. But... Um, now, here's how they kind of bolster their hypo hypothesis, pointing out that Jesus had been given some liquid on a sponge while on the cross, and that's in Mark 15, 36, right? So they say they, they got some Gatorade, <laughs> some first century Gatorade, and gave it to him on the cross, and that just miraculously revived him, right? Pilate seemed surprised at how quickly Jesus had succumbed to the cross, which he did. He did. He, he was kind of surprised, but we're going to talk about that in a little bit is, um, because usually crucifixions were drawn out as a form of torture. Short answer, but we'll get more into that. Consequently, they said Jesus' reappearance wasn't a miraculous resurrection. Oh, no, no, no. But merely a fortuitous resuscitation, and his tomb was empty because he continued to live. Like the urban myth, uh, like an urban myth, the swoon theory continues to flourish, sadly. Um, but what does the evidence really establish? Think about that. What does the evidence really establish? What actually happened at the crucifixion? And what was Jesus's cause of death? Is there any possible way he could have survived the ordeal? And we're going to talk about that um, in a little bit more, right? Okay. Um, uh, the, the theory was developed early in the 19th century. But today has been completely given up for several reasons. And we're going to, there's three of them. If you're taking notes, here's the three reasons why the swoon theory doesn't work. First, it is a physical impossibility that Jesus could have survived the tortures of crucifixion. We're going to get into excruciating detail on that in a minute. Second, the soldiers who crucified Jesus were experts in executing this type of death penalty. They themselves would be killed if they did not perform an execution as. Uh, it being ending in a lethal manner. Third, they took several precautions to make sure he was actually dead. They thrust a spear in his side, and when the blood, water and blood came out separately, this indicates that the blood cells had begun to separate from the plasma, or it was a pericardial infusion, which only happens when the blood stops circulating, right? And remember that they were thinking about going to break the legs of all three of them in order to speed up the process of dying before the Passover, they examined Jesus and found he was already dead, which is also a fulfillment of prophecy that none of his bones would be broken. So, right. Next, 
After being taken down from the cross, Jesus was covered with 80 pounds of spices and embalmed, right? So how could he breathe through tightly wrapped swaths filled with um, frankincense and myrrh, right? It's unreasonable to believe that after three days with no food or water, Jesus would revive after such horrendous torture and shock. It's even harder to believe that Jesus could roll a two-ton stone up an incline overpower the guards, and then walk several miles to Emmaus, where he meets two of the apostles. Even if Jesus had done this, his appearing to the disciples half dead and desperately in need of medical attention would not have prompted their worship of him as God, right? So if he had shown up, if he was beaten, he was mangled mess, and Isaiah actually says that he couldn't even be recognized as a man. But then he shows up to the apostles later. If he was in that kind of condition, wouldn't would they be amazed? No, they wouldn't have had the same type of response. So, all right. So the fourth one of misinformation is the stolen body theory, and this one is a biggie. The fourth argument holds that the Jewish and Roman authorities stole the body or moved it for safekeeping right? So that's why they moved it. It's inconceivable to think of this as a possibility that if they had the body, why didn't they need to accuse the disciples in stealing it? Which they, Matthew 28, 11 actually says, you, they accused the apostles of stealing the body, right? So in Acts 4, the Jewish authorities were angered and did everything they could to prevent the spread of Christianity. So why would the disciples deceive their own people, their family, their friends, their loved ones, their community? Why would they deceive them in believing in a false Messiah when they knew that the deception would mean the deaths of hundreds of people and their believing friends? Think about that. What would be their motive? What would be their heart behind that? if they knew that it was deception, right? And Dan, that's true. They held onto their faith to the point of death for most all of them, except for the Apostle John. They all died a martyr's death, right? So it's a very important point that throughout the preaching of the apostles, the authorities never attempted to refute the resurrection by producing a body. This theory has pretty much zero merit other than the words being written, okay? Fifth, the soldiers... Fell asleep. That's right. Napping on the job. All right. Napping does have its benefits, but not when you're guarding a Messiah. Okay. So thus far, we've been studying the evidence for the resurrection. We examined four theories using an attempt to invalidate the miracle. This is this is what people will say is the list of possible um, reasons for uh, Jesus, some other um, substitutionary truth other than that he resurrected, right? So careful analysis reveals the theories were inadequate to refute the resurrection. The fifth and the most popular theory that has existed since the day of the resurrection is still believed by many opponents of Christianity. And Matthew 28, 12, and 13 articulates this position, right? And there it says, when the chief of priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money telling them, hey, you are to say his disciples came during the night and stole them away while we were asleep. Got it? Hey, I got a guy. I got a guy. All right. So it was this plot. It was this scheme like some guy from Jersey working with the mafia. All right. All right. Here's a little something, something for you. Okay. Forget about it. All right. All right. So if, if I may, um, just to bring up uh, to your point, the consequence for soldiers falling asleep was automatic death mm -hmm. and these were groups of soldiers so it couldn't have not been a whole group of soldiers taking a nap and this was the roman army which was the best fighting force in the world at that time as well and on top of that these soldiers every couple hours they were getting filtered out by other soldiers so they couldn't have not been there was they were there all day they were sleeping every few hours they were being switched out by by soldiers that you know can't be sleeping at all <laughs> mm -hmm. very good that's awesome very good True, very true. So if you're taking notes, I've got uh, five reasons that this is brouhaha, boulder dash, and ballyhoo. Work with me. Number one, the reason this is not um, solid forensics evidence. First, if the soldiers were sleeping, how did they know it was the disciples who stole the body? 
That would be an assumption if they were sleeping. Second, it seems physically impossible for the disciples to sneak past this whole tiptoe through, right? Shh, right? They're going to tiptoe through a, a Roman guard and then move a two ton stone, 4,000 pounds. Okay, let's say it's half of that. It's just 2,000 pounds, all right? I can't deadlift over 300 pounds, right? And how did 12 smelly, scruffy fishermen sneak past the guards and move a two ton stone, right? It's an, it, it, it would have to be absolute, that's like Jedi capability, all right? So third, number three, the tomb was secured with a Roman seal. So anyone who moved the stone, stone would have to break that seal, which is an offense punishable by death. Anyone who broke that seal, they would be they would be killed if it was found out. So the 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 um, um, penalty for this was extremely high. Dan, you had a question. Yeah, yeah. Are we sure that it was Roman guards that were watching it, or were they Jewish? It, you could go either way. I'm, I'm okay with both because it would still have a contingent that would be fairly large, and the logic still remains. The, the, mm -hmm. the penalty for breaking the seal, like if we think about it, even the, the first one, which is mm -hmm. the soldiers were sleeping, it doesn't matter if they're Jewish or Roman. Um, yes. The impossibility for the disciples to sneak past them, right? So the mm -hmm. logic still holds. Um, right. It's just if it was a Roman guard, um, the, the penalty to them would be very significant. And just for everyone else, just so you know, there, there's some discussion that um, Pilate, when the Pharisees requested to put a guard on the tomb, he said, you have a guard. And some people say, well, that means it was Jewish, so they weren't really Roman. Again, it's another fallacy that's brought up to try and belittle what was going on here. Either way, there were guards here, and the stakes were huge whether they were Jewish or Roman. Yeah, in that's the, what I was thinking about, what, what uh, Pilate said to, uh, he said that you have guards, mm -hmm. you go and guard it. Yep, and that's okay. The logic mm -hmm. still holds, right? We're, we're not, we're not at loss, you know, theologically, and we still have right. um, that. Okay, oh, lost my place. Okay, fourth Roman guards were not likely to fall asleep with such an important duty, or the Jewish officials, right? The disciples would have needed to overpower them. So think about it. you got these, again, the scruffy, scurrilous little fishermen from northern Israel who lived on a lake their whole life. They've got to overpower guards, whether they're Jewish or Roman. They're going to be armed, right? Because that's what guards do, right? Think about it today. It's very rare that we see a guard on duty who's not carrying some type of uh, gun of some sort. Same was true then. They would have been armed men, a group of armed men. So the disciple would have, um, that would have been unlikely. It's just unlikely. Okay, finally, the fifth point is the Gospel of John. The grave clothes were found lying there as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. We see that in John 20, verse 6 and 7. So there was not enough time. Now, so what, what would have to happen? All right, think about this. They would... Uh, the guards would have to be sleeping. So how would they know, Jewish or Roman, they would have to know that it was the disciples. But if they're asleep, how did they know it was a disciple? Second, they had to sneak past the soldiers and move a two-ton stone, 2,000 pounds. Think about that. Up an incline in absolute silence. Third, they would have to break the seal. So that would mean they all were committing treason to the point of death. Fourth, the Roman guards are not likely to be asleep with such an important duty. That's extremely unlikely. And fifth, there was the um, head cloth that was still there when the disciples come. The, the things that he was buried in were there. There was not enough. They had to accomplish all of that within minutes while everyone's asleep. It's just so extremely unlikely, all right? And think about it. In robbery, the men would have flung the garments down in disorder and fled for fear of detection in their very lives, right? So uh, we had a hand raised here. Who had their hand up? I think it was. That's, uh, that's me first. Yeah. Uh, just a quick question. Um, speaking of those five things, uh, you know, if, if you know, in some way you could bypass or accomplish those five things uh, and sneak past the guards or, you know, they're asleep and the seal is broken somehow and maybe replaced, um, what would be the incentive for a guard, whether Jewish or Roman, 
any incentive? What would be that incentive for them to actually get Jesus out of the out of the tomb? Like, what what would that be, and and how impactful would that be in terms of this misinformation theory? It's a great point. It's a very good. It's such a great point. It's so true. The the mo what would be the motive, right? Motives are so critical in any court of law, right? Uh, why did they have to put such a heavy stone in front of a, a dead? <laughs> it's a great question. If he's so dead, why did they have to put? Well, actually, that was very that was very normal in those days because uh, tombs to keep them from being uh, pilfered and you know tomb. There are real tomb raiders, right? Back then, because sometimes, uh, especially with wealthy people, they would be buried with items of value uh, to a degree. And um, families own those tombs. It's, it's a lot different than it is uh, today. And you can still see them in Israel to this day, where there's, there's tombs that are owned by families for centuries. And that stone was placed there to deter simple grave robbers from going in and pilfering or dealing with the, the, uh, um, the dead bodies. So it's a good question, though. It's a very good question. Okay, the conclusion here. Of these five... Uh, uh, theories and misinformation, they inadequately account for the empty tomb, right? And the transformation of the apostles, right? The conclusion we must seriously consider is that Jesus rose from the grave, just from these five. We're not, we're not done yet, all right? First, if he rose from the dead, then what he said about himself is true. Everyone turn in your Bibles to John eleven twenty five, John eleven twenty five, 25. And, I, and I, uh, I would like for somebody to read that for us, share it as a group. Okay, it says, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, that he were dead, yet shall he live. Amen. Can I get a witness? Can I get a help? Come on, raise the hand. Woo! Hallelujah. All right, that's, that's some serious drop the mic type stuff there. I am the resurrection and life. He who believes in me shall li live even if he dies. He just proved that he could do it here in this in this second. Uh, let's also look at um, 1 Corinthians 15, 54. 1 Corinthians 15, 54. I'd like for somebody to read that. First Corinthians fifteen fifty four. <clears throat> I'll read it. Okay, thank you, Susan. It says, uh, "Then, when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled: Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting?" Woo! I like that. All right. When I get up in the morning, it hurts. <laughs> it's painful. Dan, right now, especially painful for you with the surgery, right? Yeah, yeah. So physical death is not the end. Eternal life with our Lord awaits all who trust him because Jesus has conquered death and the grave. Jesus has conquered death in the grave. Let that sink in. Okay, now, worldly wisdom. Let's read what the Bible tells us about this from a biblical perspective. So let's look. Uh, somebody look at 1 Corinthians 13, 18 through 21. 1 Corinthians 3. I'm sorry, I think I said 13. 1 Corinthians 3, 18 through 21. Who would like to read that? I'll read it. Um, 1 Corinthians what would you say three three the verse 18 18 let no one deceive himself if anyone among you seems to be wise in this age let him become a fool that he may become wise for the wisdom of this world is foolishness with god for it is written he catches the wise in their own craft craftiness and again the lord knows the thoughts of the wise that are Futile. Therefore, let no one boast in men, for all things are yours. 
Thank you very much, Pat. So what do we see there? It's, it's like, hey, let's not try and figure this out from a worldly perspective. Because the world has theories, it doesn't mean that they're right. They have to, they have to prove those theorems to hold soundness in their thought process, in their logic, right? And what, this is one of the reasons why, not to, to bring up a Pandora's box, but why I'm I'm very much against the concept of evolution, especially Christian. Uh, evolution, uh, mixing those two, is because I believe that that is mixing uh, two different elements. And we've talked about that before in a previous doctrinal class, um, something that we have a lot of resources on. So, Chris, you had a question? Yes, verse 18 reminds me of the uh, the same people say, question everything. For example, <laughs> you go to a car dealership, they say, hey, there's this fee that I didn't tell you about. Two minutes later, there's another fee I told you about. Two minutes later, there's another fee I didn't tell you about. Question everything. So I feel like that's what the verse is telling us, to question everything, to take a step back and say, as, as someone who's not so educated, and question it from there. That's what this verse reminds me of. Good. Very good. Uh, Christo, you had your hand raised? No? Okay. All right. All right. So next, we also have this verse, 1 Corinthians 1, 18. Who would like to read that? First Corinthians 1, 18 through 25. Want me to read again? Okay. For this message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring it to nothing, the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolishness the wisdom of the world? Mm -hmm. For since the wisdom of God, the word for wisdom, did not know God, it pleased God through the <clears throat> foolishness of the message preached to those who are believers. Am I stopping there? Did you want okay. more verses? Uh, keep going through 25. 25, okay. For Jewish request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block to the Greeks' foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see, 20, oh, that was 26, okay. That's okay. That's great, though. But think about this. Two two key lines. Look at the uh, First Corinthians eighteen uh, one. Sorry, vert, one verse eighteen. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. It's it's foolishness to them. They mentally have to refute that. Their energies are bent on refuting the cross because if the cross and the resurrection are true, that requires their repentance. That's why it's foolishness to them, because they want their pleasure of their sinful life over the truthfulness of God's work and his redeeming love, right? And then the, the last one, on verse 25, the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Think about that. God became man, and in his weakness, we'll use that word loosely, he died. He died on a cross, a shameful, one of the most shameful forms of death ever created. God himself took on flesh and died in the shamefulness because even in his weakness, he's infinitely greater than anything else in his weakness. Chris, you had a, you had a comment? I feel like this verse is saying, Jesus saying to us, you know, even those who are, you know, too smart, you know, supposedly and say they don't have faith. He, he's giving a warning to us about the resurrection saying, yeah. forget what you know, forget what you think and logic. Watch what I'm going to do. Yeah. Well, and, you know, Chris, that's a great point. I can also say that, um, uh, you know, we could easily look at these and realize that it could speak to us from the aspect of um, if somebody isn't an apologetic person, if somebody is new to the faith and trying to assimilate all this information, this is kind of an encouragement to go, you, you don't have to have all the answers because the world's going to lie to you. The world's going to try and deceive you. 
The world's going to try and reason away what the cross and the resurrection has done. So it's kind of an anchor um, to the Corinthians and to us as well that we need to be cognizant that we can't think like the world. Alexandra, did you have a comment? Uh, yeah, before before that, I think Dan posted something just so you remember to, to look. Oh, but I just wanted to highlight um, the one verse, I think it was... Uh, verse 22 from what, what we just read. It says, For Jews request a sign. G G Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. So you see where the focus is in all these different cultures or religions. Mm -hmm. And our focus is on the resurrection of Christ or Christ himself. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Very true. And it's a great point. And, and it also speaks to apologetically. Um, you know, the, the Jews are still waiting for the sign of a Messiah. When I went to Israel many, many years ago, and they, they have billboards there with pictures of guys that they think is the Messiah that's coming back as rabbis who've died. I saw it myself. I was asking our tour guide, what, what is that? What is that? They believe that that guy was the Messiah, that rabbi, and he's died and he's going to come back. I was like, Wow. And there's more than one of them, too. It's kind of crazy. And Dan said that he was born in shamefulness and he died in shamefulness. And that's very true. He took on that shame so that we could have his glory. That's, that's worth thinking about. He took on our shame so we could take on his glory. It's a great point, Dan. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the next one that we're going to talk about, this is we're going to talk about the critical loss of reasoning. So there are four historical facts which must be explained by any ad, uh, adequate historical hypothesis. So just realize that um, this is kind of a snapshot of what we have to filter this through, because this is true with any kind of forensic or scientific research, that there has to be a discovery, there has to be um, factors that, and correlating information that point to truth. So one of those is, number one, is Jesus's burial. Has, we've seen that Jesus was obviously buried. There's there's nine accounts overall of Jesus's burial as a f historical fact, right? And no one has refuted that to this day. Uh, the discovery is of, of his empty tomb, that's debated, um, but we've seen that it's refutable. Third is his post-mortem appearances. If he hadn't appeared to people, as they say, there was over 500 of them. If he had not appeared to them um, after his death, then th the faith would have died almost instantaneously. The origin of the disciples' belief in his resurrection. Again, that they would um, be willing to risk their own lives and the lives of their family for this. If it's farcical, if it's if it's uh, makeup, what was their gain? Like, like we were talking about earlier, what's in it for them, right? So the conclusion here is that there is a mountain of historical, archaeological, philosophical, scientific, and logically sound reason to accept the resurrection of fact, right? Let me say that again. There's a mountain of historical, archaeological, philosophical, scientific, and logically sound reasons to accept the resurrection as fact. Right. And, and again, to illustrate this, and we talked about at the beginning, we are just covering the tip of the iceberg there. Each one of those things we talked about, the historical, archaeological, philosophical, there are books written in detail on those subjects with um, fact after fact, corroborating evidence and detail. So we're especially from the academic world, but we, time we're going to move on. So did Jesus prophesy his death? Can somebody read Mark 8, 31 through 33? Who'd like to read Mark 8, 31 through 33? I'll read it. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he was stating the matter plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning around and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. 
for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but on man's. Ooh, that was good. Thank you. Thank you. And we also have Matthew 6, 21 through 23. Who'd like to read that? Matthew 16, 21 through 23. I can do that one. 16, 21. Um, from that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far it be from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Very good. We've got one more that we're going to do. Luke 9, 21 through 22. Who'd like to read that one? I'll take that one. And he strictly warned and commanded them to tell this to no one. For the, the man, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised on the third day. Then he said to them all, oh, just 21, 22? Okay. Yeah, that's, it. that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Here, and here's the thing. There's six more specific verses. And also in Matthew 20, 17, it specifically mentions crucifixion. So, so why is this important? Well, for me, anyone who prophesies his own death and resurrection, I'm going to listen to them, what they have to say, right? They've got some straight cred to be able to, to, to say those kind of things prophetically. So he clearly was saying that this was the plan all along. God wasn't making this up, right? He, God wasn't dealing in a reactionary mode. And it actually says that Christ was crucified before the foundations of the world because God exists outside of time. So that there's, there's this element here that this intentionality of the resurrection was always a part of it. And so the point here, one of the many points in this section is, that the resurrection wasn't um, the Father coming in at the last minute to, minute to play hero and sending the Holy Spirit to revive. But this was the plan. Jesus knew this. Jesus knew why he was coming to earth to die for our sins and that he had the hope. And he expressed and role modeled faithful hopefulness for us in trusting the Father, right? So next one. Did Jesus actually die? Is it resurrection? Or is it resuscitation? Ooh, say that quick. Resuscitation. Resurrection or resuscitation. All right, let's go. Let's hit it. Okay. Um, we've got, here's here's the four, or the, I'm sorry, the six E's of evidence. Six E's of evidence. Number one, he was executed painfully, mercifully, and just excruciatingly, he was executed. Next, the empty tomb, which we talked a little bit about. The eyewitness events. The early accounts, all right, that happened, how soon they were written, in the emergence of the church. This does not mean the emergent church in the sense of the doctrine or the recent heretical teachings by some people within the church. This talks about the early church growth, right? And six is the early creeds that we see, right? Now, execution. Um, some skeptics uh, believe that Jesus just passed uh, out on the cross or faked his own death. These were once popular theories among skeptics, and we've talked about that, but they've been discredited. They're not, they're not used very much anymore, right? And even the famous atheist historian Gerd Ludman has acknowledged that the historical evidence for Jesus' execution is indisputable, right? You may also have this. There's, it's a long list here, but um, for resurrection to take place, there must be a death, right? No dispute from serious scholars and skeptics have arisen from anywhere in the world of his death, right? Multiple first century documents in wit both witness and attest to the risen Lord. Um, there are five sources outside of the Bible 
that corroborate that his execution occurred. Five sources, right? That's more than I believe Alexander the Great existed, right? I think there's only one document that claims that. Crucifixion is not a condition someone can fake. A crucifixion can't be fake, right? Uh, pericardial effusion equals blood and water building up around the heart. And we see that when this, the spear went aside. And the American uh, Medical Association Journal published a medical and historical record of Jesus, which explained how it was plausible that he died even before the spear had pierced his side. Right? So let's remember what happened the night before uh, his crucifixion. First of all, he, um, Jesus, he sweats blood. And in Luke 22, it said that when he was on the Mount of uh, Transfiguration, he, he, his disciples followed him. And when he was praying, it was so hard in his prayer, so fervent, that he started bleeding uh, these, these uh, sweats of drops of blood. Well, that's actually called, it's clinically been shown to be called hematidrosis. Hematidrosis. Another complicated word. But it's not very common but it is documented and associated with a high degree of psychological stress. What happens is during severe anxiety or stress, it creates, um, releases chemicals that break down the capillaries in the sweat glands. As a result, there's a small amount of bleeding into these glands. And as the sweat comes out, it's tinged with blood. We're not talking about large amounts of blood, but it is visible, right? So the next is crucifixion. The chances of surviving the crucifixion were extremely bleak. Crucifixion and tortures that normally preceded it was the worst way to die in the ancient world. A person was scourged to the point usually their intestines, arteries, and veins were laid bare. So what that means is, is that if, if you ever do any study on this, it's very intense that the the cat and nine tails or whatever whipping they would do actually was laden with bones and pieces of shards of glass and rock. So the um, executioner or the, the individual doing the, the torture would swing the whip around the waist of the individual. So they would, if this was the individual, they would swing it in a way that it would wrap. And then the executioner would pull like this which would spin the cords and the shards this way and would lacerate and just cut open the, the human beings. It was very normal for organs to be exposed from this and profuse amounts of bleeding. Um, maybe you've heard the, the statement, um, 40 lashes save one or 39 lashes. That, that phrase, if you haven't heard it, it, it used to be more common, but what that refers to is that in the ancient times, the, the Romans had actually realized through study that they could lacerate somebody that way with a whipping, a flogging, on average 39 times and they would survive. 40th time, they're more likely to die at that point than any other given time. They were that clinically accurate in their torture. So think about that. When Jesus was there on the post being whipped, his very organs would be bare. And remember, Isaiah also tells us that we wouldn't recognize him. If we saw him, we wouldn't recognize him as a man, right? So then after the person was flogged, they were dragged out where they were impaled to a cross on a tree and left hanging there in excruciating pain, right? Um, excruciating actually means out of the cross, which I think is, is interesting. The pain was unbearable. In fact, it was literally beyond words to describe. They had to invent a new word to describe this pain. And um, think of that. They, they, there's nothing in the language that could describe the intense anguish caused during the crucifixion. right? Because when the nails went in, um, in, you know, in his hands, hands meant in Jewish, um, Aramaic, and, and those languages, the hand was the forearm and the whole wrist. So there's actually they've proven that they can put nails in somebody and it will support the weight. But there's also nerve endings that are in there. And it's the intentionality that when they hammered in to that part of the wrist, what was holding up, it would press on that nerve, which would just create excruciating pain in through the, the hand and into the body, right? Then we also have that Jesus' side is pierced. 
And in John 19, 31, it says that um, he was actually a pierce there. And that's important because it says not one of his bones will shall be broken. And that's the fulfillment of prophecy. But um, when, when we look at this, the fact that his side is pierced and the blood and water died, this is important. The, it's called hypovolemic shock would have caused a sustained rapid heart rate that would have contributed to heart failure. This heart failure causes, um, it results in the collection of fluid in the membrane around the heart called pericardial effusion. Pericardial effusion, as well as around the lungs, which is a pleural effusion. I've actually had pleurisy before. I've had um, fluid on my lungs. It's not a good thing. It's very painful. So the Roman soldier would come around and being fairly certain that Jesus was dead, he would confirm that by thrusting a spear into his right side. Now think about this. If he was just passed out, don't you think that that great horrendous amount of pain would have woken him? All right. That kind of pain is inconceivable. So the spear apparently went through the right lung and into the heart where the pericardial effusion was. So when the spear was pulled out, some fluid the pericardial effusion, and the blood would both come out. So that would have had the appearance of clear fluid, like water, follow, followed by a large volume of blood. And that's what the eyewitnesses in John's gospel describe. Um, John probably had no idea what he was describing when he saw it, right? Um, but certainly it's not like an untrained person like him could have anticipated. For him to write that at that time with limited medical knowledge, it seems unlikely, but John's description is consistent with what modern medicine would tell us to expect from what happened. Yes, uh, Alexander? Yeah, I uh, just wanted to also, uh, I've also experienced that. I've had lung collapse, mm -hmm. and when, when liquid goes in between the lung and the chest, mm -hmm. and it, there's a membrane where it has, it's like full of, of nerves, that is in between your lung organ and, and your chest, that, that is extremely painful. I had, to, I had to be put on morphine and all sorts of stuff. So it's really bad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was like not even a, that, that much of a, a damage to what happened to me. I can't imagine what, what happened to him. Yeah, excruciating, right? But I'm, I'm glad you healed well. Do you, do you fully recover? Yes, yes, I fully recovered, yeah. Uh, thank, thank God for modern medicine. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so now I'll grant you that the socials, they didn't go to medical school, right? But remember that they were experts in killing people. That was their job, right? That was their job is to kill people. They knew without a doubt when a person was dead. They would not have been confused or easily dissuaded from observing this as a fact or if somebody was faking it, right? So this isn't really hard to figure out. Besides, if a prisoner somehow escaped or lived through that, the responsible soldiers themselves would be put to death. So they had a huge incentive to make absolutely sure that each and every victim was dead when he was removed from the cross. Does that make sense? So they're, they're experts in killing people through the crucifixion and whether or not. So some people have said, well, that's why they didn't break the legs is because, you know, Jesus was just swooning. But that, that outpouring of blood and water alone would have been deadly for somebody in the first century. Right. Next, we talk about the empty tomb a little bit, a little bit more. The, the New Testament reports that the first Easter morning, the women found the body in the tomb and Peter and John later confirmed this for themselves. So this is one of the strongest pieces of evidence of how even the enemies of Jesus implicitly admitted that the tomb was empty. They did. They, they, the people who were there said it was empty. In a court of law, this would be called adversarial corroboration. There's another 25-cent word. Adversarial corroboration, meaning the opposition's testimony supports your own account. So their own legal sense they were condemning themselves. So um, the Pharisees and the Sadducees' acceptance of the empty, empty tomb was proof of its own truth. How do we know? They would have simply said, resurrection, baloney, go up in the tomb. It's right here. See the body for yourself, right? 
So rather than refute the claims that Jesus' burial place was vacant, they made up stories to explain why the body was missing, right? Right? This would be synonymous. Guys, so listen, listen. This would be the same thing as a child telling his teacher, my dog ate my homework. I'm just saying, it's that much credibility. It implies the student does not have his homework, but he has an excuse as to why, all right? It's a fallacious, shallow argument. So, all right, so Jesus was buried in Joseph's tomb, which the point of that is it was very visible. We talked about that. And then he, he was risen. So uh, one of the other key points here is uh let's well let's that's we've talked about some of those pieces so the eyewitnesses sorry we forgot to put them point by point so that's kind of a shotgun of information so um the four real quickness about the eyewitnesses uh the disciples saw the risen savior himself some of them multiple times over 40 days jesus appeared to individuals in groups in various variety of circumstances in all, we have nine ancient sources inside and outside the New Testament converting, confirming the resurrection, right? And there are hundreds of historical corroborating details in the Gospel of Luke, which leads us toward the reliability of this account and the resurrection of the Gospel of Luke, as well as the book of Acts. Luke is replete. It is rich with all these ancient archaeological references, which time and again have been proven. Like there, there's four Herods. He keeps them all sequential. There's um, different references to Pilate. Pilate has been archaeologically discovered. And we could go on. There, we could do an hour on just much more an hour on that. So the uh, four New Testament Gospels, biographies of Jesus, right, were all written in the first century. So that's very early. That's actually historically very close to the actual occurrence event. So why is that relevant? What do you think? Why is that relevant how early those written records of the Gospels are? Accuracy. Accuracy. I mean, that, that proves the, the time frame is correct. So if, if, they, if they did it much later, then are they imagining? Are they putting pieces together maybe they didn't have? So just the fact that they lived in the in the era that Jesus lived proves, you know, their story. Mm -hmm. Here's the thought. So if we read the newspaper today and it said, hey, by the way, guess what? Donald Trump won the presidency in the election. All right. We would have problems with that, wouldn't we? Because there's refutable evidence. To t now, that can be. Not to bring up a controversial issue, right? But the point being is we can refute that because that's not what we're, we've heard. That's not current. And it, even though it's a controversial issue, right, the way the status is right now, that's not true, right? Probably the worst of, of choices for my illustration. But the point being is what would happen is there were over 500 witnesses who watched him one day when he ascended. And if this was written in the time of their lifetime, anyone could go and say, hey, Moise, hey, did you actually see this guy raised from the grave? Do you know what I'm talking about? When he went up to heaven, were you there? Right? You know, you see what I'm saying? They could corroborate and question witnesses who actually saw the risen Lord. That gives credibility because if – the four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if they wrote that and it was inaccurate, there were over 2 million people that were living in Jerusalem at the time. It would have been squashed immediately as like, hey, I know my brother was there. He says it's all baloney. They just made it up as they went along. It's very strong proof that the fact that it corroborates and with the external um, historical evidence that there is, it's huge, huge, huge there. So. Uh, oh, also, Pat brought up, too, that when Jesus was resurrected from the grave, uh, that there were other people that were resurrected as well, too. The power of his resurrection is a foreshadow to the rapture 
um, of the church, there were other people that were raised as well. And I, forgive me, I don't remember the verse right offhand, but think about that also as well. And that, you know, your Uncle Tommy who died, you know, a, a week ago, all of a sudden he's knocking on the door. Hey, hey, let me in. I'm hungry. Hey, what you got for dinner? You know, right? That is huge. He, again, and if it's false, if it, if it isn't true, then where is the historical refutation of that, right? Because there would have been no public support for Jesus as an individual. So, yes, Pat, people knew these people were dead. Yes. Yes, a lot of, people, of the witnesses, writers were secular and didn't believe what they saw either, like Josephus, who was a um, secular historian. He, act, he was actually a Jewish trader. He went and served the Romans and was a, as a historian for the Jewish people, right? Um, so uh, some other points, Jesus appears alive in different times and in different instances to skeptics, believers, daytime, nighttime, men, women, in public and in private. Um, people touched Jesus, talked with him, ate with him, walked with him, and went fishing with him, right? This, like... There are stories that are written about it. People saw it, right? A minimum of 550 people saw the risen Lord. And we see that in the first part of Acts, Acts chapter 1, right? Some other pieces about the eyewitnesses, right? The disciples were afraid and hiding. And then after seeing the risen Savior, they are boldly proclaiming his lordship and resurrection to the point of the threat of their own lives, right? So what is a greater motivation? Is there to change someone from a coward to the courageous. They went from meek and mild to mighty martyr, martyrs for the gospel. If this was a fabrication, what, again, we've talked about it multiple times, what would be their motive? So what was the gain for the disciples? Paul shared about his suffering and for Christ in 2 Corinthians 11 through 28. So, and without going into that, the conclusion is here is, guys, why were they willing to die for the resurrection message of Jesus? Because they knew it was true. There would be no motiva motivating factor, right? Um, some other points on the eyewitnesses, the uh, John 21, 4 through uh, 14. That's when Jesus stood on the shore and they ate fish with him, another example. And also, it, whoop, and there was also the risen Lord when he um, appeared to Mary Magdalene. And the reason I put on there the point about the women in the social order of that day. Now, we're speaking in historical context, and this could be a sensitive subject for some. But when we understand the role of women in the first century Jewish society, it's very extraordinary that this empty tomb story should feature women as the discoverers of the empty tomb. It, it, believe it or not, women were on a very low rung in the social ladder in first century Palestine. Now, obviously, you know, the Bible tells us that all are equal, Greek, uh, Hebrew and Greek, male and female. Um, they're, we're all equal in Christ, right? But in the context of that culture, um, women's testimony wasn't valid in a court of law. And there were old rabbinical sayings that said, let the words of the law be burned rather than delivered to women. That, that's horrendous, right? It's not right. It's absolutely abhorrent. Um, and and it, why is more than anything else is because women are made in the image of God as well, right? They're not less than, they're equal to, right? Um, and they, well, in light of this, it's absolutely remarkable that the chief witnesses to the empty tomb are those women who were friends of Jesus. Any later legendary account would have certainly portrayed male disciples as discovering the tomb, Peter or John, right? They would have wanted to massage the truth a little bit and kind of downplay that the women found it because it wasn't even considered valid witness, a valid witness, right? This shows that the gospel writers faithfully recorded what happened, even if it was embarrassing, right? They would have received ridicule over this point, but they wrote it that way because it was truthful and factual. So this speaks to the historicity of this um, rather than a legendary status. So uh, let's see. Oh, thank you, Dan. Matthew 27, 52, for the reason, 
the those who raise up. We had a hand raised. Who had a hand raised? Yes, I was going to say for a woman to testify that during that century is, as you were saying, it's very uh, very bold of them. <laughs> I'm sure they didn't have much favor from you know their their community, the Jewish community back then, mm-hmm. because I actually work at a synagogue on Shabbat for at, at a Jewish community in Surfside, and there's not much of a difference between first century Jewish women and Jewish women today, because unfortunately, um, when I'm there working at the synagogue protecting them, because I do protective services, they can't go inside and pray with the men. I have to ask them kindly to go to a different area in the building where there's a woman's section. They can't even pray in the same area in public. Sad. Oh, thank you. Thank you for sharing, Chris. It's so true. It's so sad. And, and clearly the New Testament does not teach that, right? Um, in the whole soundness of God's counsel, uh, we're both created in the image of God and uniquely like Him. And and also to go back to even Israel, today when we go to the Wailing Wall, there's a section for the men to pray and there's a section for the women to pray. You know, and that's, that's the improper division, I think, of the body. Um, the only time I really feel that men and women should be separated is when they go to the bathroom. That's all I'm saying. And there's only two, male or female, nothing in between. That's well, that, 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 might that's change, another. that might soon change one day. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's that's another teaching, another day. We'll go, Maybe we'll do that. Uh, there, I have a teaching on male and female. All right, so moving right along. Okay, so uh, historian Mark Strauss, he says, Luke's gospel begins with a prologue. It's actually one of the finest Greek selections in the whole New Testament. Luke, Luke actually wrote art, artistically. He was very gifted. We don't hear that because it's translated from the um, Greek into the, well, it was actually, they were mostly spoken and told to Luke through Aramaic, written down in Greek, and then it's kind of transliterated through Latin and ending up in English, right? But it's beautiful. But one of the finest Greek selections in the whole New Testament, Luke was clearly a literary artist, but in the prologue, he points out that he has carefully investigated the material that he presents in the gospel, and that he has checked with eyewitness accounts who were actually present, firsthand eyewitness accounts. So if we read this prologue, you see that this is the work of a historian. This is someone who has done their research. And again, I want to establish that Luke, one of the key points about Luke, it it is so interesting, is the amount of detail is huge within Luke cultural context, um, references, um, lineage, the, um, the the rulers of the, the time, the, the customs and what was going on. Whereas you look at Mark, it's interesting because Mark is actually very crude Greek. It's very simple. It would be almost like street language Greek and um, was not very artistic. It was the antithesis of that, but it still is inspired. What do we learn from that? God uses everyone regardless of their abilities. He has the ability to use anyone for his glory. So that was a tangent. But uh, Without having reliable testimony for the emptiness of Jesus' tomb, the early Christian community could not have survived in Jerusalem proclaiming the resurrection of Christ. Um, that's by uh, Pannenberg. And, and what that means is simply it, with the documentation that was there by the, the eyewitnesses and then the gospels that came out early and that they were written and shared, it's actually interesting because to refute, to refute this, the Pharisees and the Sadducees actually had a mockery of the book of Matthew made. In other words, it was a parody. They had written a parody of the gospel of Matthew to try and refute it. They went to a lot of effort to try and refute this and it didn't work. They tried to force it. They, think about it. They tried to, they, not only did they try and kill Jesus, they also planned on killing Lazarus, and they ended up killing all the apostles. And the gospel persevered. Why? Because it's truth and because it changes people's lives. There's power in his word, right? Um, and we're going to skip that one. Can, okay. can I just me- mention one thing real quick? Yes. Um, um, uh, so that that is a testimony in in and of itself that's sort of like evidence the impact of the early church and their success throughout the entire region of the evangelism they did proves that it was not like it it, that message didn't fall flat and if 
if the resurrection was true as we know it is, and we have all the accounts that corroborate in the sources, then how could anyone conceivably think that, you know, if it wasn't true, it such a lie, such a huge lie could have had such a big impact even throughout these thousands and thousands of years now that, you know, I mean, now it's even more popular than ever. <laughs> so it, 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 it's not possible. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, before I get to you, Chris, hold on. One, one point on that, Alexandro. Um, interesting note, and we, we want to define this, people will die for what they believe is the truth. The early eyewitnesses saw with their own eyes truth. But today, sadly, we have people who die for a faith, a false belief, like Muslim terrorists who decide to strap themselves with a bomb and walk into a shopping mall. Right, but they're not eyewitnesses, and that's a clear differentiation. Right, the martyrdom that, that the Muslims believe in, where they get the seventy virgins and, and the fast pass up to heaven. Right, um, they're dying for something that they've been told, and they believe. Right, the the early the Christian forefathers, um, including the early church. And the apostles all were willing to die because they had seen it. They had seen it. And that's distinctly different. But it it parallels with what you're saying. It very much parallels with what you're saying. And Chris, you had a comment? Yes, I was going to say, I don't know who made the statement. Uh, I believe it was, uh, I'm not exactly sure. But I, I heard the statement before, and this is kind of true. It takes more faith to believe God doesn't exist than to see it does. Because, I mean, you're going against all of the evidence saying that God doesn't exist when it's more clear evidence that there's proof and there's testimony and there's witness, you know, that I, I'm sure you understand what I'm saying. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. See, <laughs> I agree with you. And that's my, my thought about evolution because scientifically I'll become a believer in evolution when somebody produces forensic proof, hard scientific proof of forms changing from one species to an, I'll believe it, but the, the, the proof isn't there. The, the fossil record doesn't show these transitory um, records of species changing from one into another. As far back as they go, they, we see that there's these types of, and that's actually spoken of in um, Genesis when it talks about Noah went into the ark with types of animals, and that's what we see today. A dog is a dog. It's always been a dog. A cat is a cat. It's always been a cat, whether it's a tiger, a lion, or a house cat. It's still feline, right? So it's this proof, this this proof that, that and I and I use that analogy because it again, what when we go back to what we said earlier about the worldly wisdom, we have to be aware that the world is trying to lie to us. The thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And we have these teachings and we talk about these elements to encourage one another. It encourages me, I hope it encourages you. But it's also to go, hey, let's take a hard look at this and see if logically this makes sense. Are we just believing in unicorns, pixies, and little elves that fart out skills, right? Okay, right? Because there's a big difference between what I want to believe and what's the truth. And sometimes in Christianity, that truth is hard to deal with. But when we look at the facts, at the key element, clearly we see the proof of the resurrection. Um, Alex, you had did, you had your hand up. Did you have something you wanted to share? Maybe not. I was, I was going to say there's a there's a difference between uh, evolution and adaptation. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Good. And elaborate elaborate for us a little bit, Dan. Well, if if animals get used to living in a in an atmosphere, they adapt to that atmosphere. Just like uh, Southerners, they're used to adapting with hot weather, while us Northerners, what's 10 below zero? <laughs> you you well, adapt you Yes, it, to use a specific example um, is Darwin's finches. Darwin said, well, some of the finches have big beaks. He would see the beaks would grow over certain times when the, the weather was um, less 
um, fruitful on the Galapagos and sometimes it would shrink, right? And he would say this adaptation, which we see clearly, we see adaptation. A, a tiger is not, not the same as a house cat, but they're both feline and they share the same species and DNA lineage. They're just adaptations. And the reason I bring up the finches is um, that was kind of one of his proofs sadly, which even, you know, today wouldn't stand much scientific scrutiny, but I actually saw a woman once who on her shoulder had Darwin's finches tattooed on her shoulder. It's uh, sad. I also, also want to bring up, uh, there, there's evidence of intraspecial, you know, uh, I guess you can call it evolution, but there's no evidence of interspecial evolution. So yes. between species, as opposed to, you know, one type of dog, with another type of dog producing a, a mutt, in a sense. Yep. So, yep. so there's absolutely no evidence of interspecial evolution. As right. a cat has never bred with a dog. There's been no ex no yeah. example of that ever happening. Yeah. But I have a mutt. He's awesome too. Choke <laughs> him. Like that. That's that's an, that's another story for another day. Okay. Early accounts. Early accounts. All right. So, um, just a couple of points on this is. Um, we want to think about that, first of all, with the early accounts, there is more than enough in a court of law that we would have won a case. We would have clearly have won a case about the resurrection of Jesus. There would have been irrefutable evidence. If, if it only takes two or three corroborating witnesses to establish a testimony in a court of law, we have over 500 eyewitness accounts, right? The earliest creeds in 1 Corinthians that we read earlier, right? Um, that creed, the way that's written, again, it, it doesn't show in English, but it's with a pentameter, a rhythm, and rhyme that makes it similar to a poem, so it could be easily memorized. And we believe that that was um, probably as early as 20 to 22 years A.D. So within a couple to three decades at the most of Christ's um, uh, crucifixion. So it's far too early to be legend. Right, First Corinthians is actually written before um, the Gospels, most of the, most of the Gospels, except for maybe Mark. So examples of uh, just just for context, examples of other historical figures and when their biographies were written. Okay, so a lot of people go, "What's well, you know?" Mark was written 10, 15 years afterwards, and Luke was written 30 years afterwards, and the Gospel of John was written, you know, 40, 50 years after. Okay, just. For those historical people to compare, Alexander the Great, probably have heard of him. The earliest documents were written 400 years after his life, and these are considered historically reliable. 400 years after his death. That's all we have for Alexander the Great. Buddha. Modern scholarship agrees that the Buddha passed away at some point between 410 and 370 BC, right? So right around 400 years before Christ. And the earliest sutras, along with the text concerning Buddha, which was written down in the first century before Christ in south of India, that's 300 years between the original documents, yet no one disputes Buddha's existence and we can go on there's a plethora of more examples of that so um do we have a question or comment Napoleon. You, yeah. sure i understood did you say that 22 years after the resurrection was the first recorded account of jesus the first corinthians 15 the one that we we read earlier is considered to be written as a creed in the original language that's that letter in first corinthians is actually written before the gospels because paul was on his uh, missionary journeys right um and the the most of the gospel writers didn't write it until uh 20 30 years later uh, tw depends upon which one but that section, we look at Paul in his, his arc of his travels, and we see that 1 Corinthians was written very early in his ministry, um, and that's probably within 20, at most 30 years after Christ's crucifixion and resurrection, not his, not his birth. But, so we're looking maybe, I think, 40, 50 uh, A.D., around that time. Does that make sense? Right? Yeah. But it's critical, again, because... It, 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 the thought was he, some people, now this isn't 
this is conjecture, but some people think that Paul may have been sharing something that was like written. You know how we, you ever heard of doxology or maybe experience it when you have these written statements that you would read in church? Like Catholics do a lot of that. There's the thought that that could have been a doxology or a kind of a way in Jerusalem that they would remind people of Jesus and that Paul could have just been sharing that. Um, at that time, because it was it was poetic in its its nature, so just fascinating bit of trivia. Fascinating. Okay, next is the emergent church. That's that was a huge thing. Uh, the resurrection was undoubtedly the central proclamation of the early church from the very beginning. The earliest Christians didn't just endorse Jesus's teachings; they were convinced they had seen him alive after his crucifixion. So they're not they're not voting based on public opinion, right? They're standing a belief based on what they saw, right? That's what changed their lives and started the the church. Certainly, since this war was their centermost conviction, they wouldn't have made absolutely sure that it was true. Somebody raised the hand, Chris. You yeah. raise your hand. I, I I'm not exactly sure who it was. It maybe it was the Prophet Muhammad, if I'm not mistaken. And um, I think he was saying I could be wrong with this. I remember, I don't know exactly who it was. They were saying, "What what I speak is the truth," but there is one after me, and he's uh, he he's the tr he's the life, I believe, or something like that. And Jesus says, "I am the way, the truth, and the life." So he is saying that he is the Messiah, and he's the one that's been been waited on for a while. Yeah, John the Baptist. He's he said, "I'm the one coming to prepare the way for the Messiah." Right, and he who comes after me, I'm not even worthy to untie his Nike. You know, sneakers, right? Because he's so perfect and pure and holy. And he did say that. And Jesus did say, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father but for me. Pharisees did not like that. Not so. All right. So, yeah. <laughs> right? so one of the key points here is, is if we want to keep this in context, in ancient history, if if their Messiah had come and the Messiah had died, their their Savior, right, Um if he had if he had not risen from the grave, why would the early church have continued on if he one of his very specific promises and prophecies was that he would return from the grave? So why would anyone follow him if he's dead and in a grave? And let me also back that up by extra biblical accounts and biblical accounts where there were other people claiming to be either leaders or messiahs. Even in the Bible, it talks about that there were people who rose up in rebellion against the Roman army. And when we look at Maccabees and the um, apocryphal works, there's these examples of people who um, were um, leaders within the community. And some were considered to be possibly messianic, right? But when they died, no one started a church after their name. No one starts a church from a dead savior, right? So why would the church continue to proliferate and do so very well in the face of opposition to the point of death unless it was based on truth? And we'll get, you know, historically we get into other reasons because it did pass on to those who were not, who were not eyewitnesses. But that's that's a different teaching you know, to get into. And we have the earliest creed, which is what we talked about in 1 Corinthians 15, 3, 7. Let's turn there because I definitely want to hit on this before we... Before we wrap up, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 7. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 7. Who would like to read that? All right. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scripture and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve after that he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time most of whom remain until now but some have fallen asleep and then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. So here's an outline of the creed. Now, actually, I have the documentation, Susan, for this section. 
It says between AD 55 and 57, so I was a little bit off. But historically, the, in, within that window, that, that section of scripture was written AD 55 to 57, very early, before most of the, the gospel. So, and it indicates here that he has already passed on this creed to the church at Corinth, which mean it must predate his visit there in AD 51. So this is just, it's getting earlier and earlier, right? Therefore, the creed was being used within 20 years of the resurrection, which historically is quite early. However, I'd agree with the various scholars who trace it back even further to within two to eight years of the resurrection from about AD 32 to 38, when Paul received it in either Damascus, remember his Damascus experience, or when he went and he spoke to the apostles in Jerusalem, which we read about in the Acts of the Apostles, right? So in one of those two visits, he would have receive this from that. And that's what we want to note. Um, so this incredibly early material, primitive, ancient, unadored testimony to the fact that Jesus appeared alive to skeptics like Paul and James, as well as to Peter and the rest of the apostles. And it's been talked, you know, um, think, think about this, the skeptics, James wasn't a believer. He was the brother of Jesus. He grew up with Jesus, right? Would you think your brother's the Messiah <laughs> or sister, right? Okay, he grew up with that. But what changed his mind? The resurrection. That is the key factor, the difference between James before Jesus was resurrected and after, right? The other part is Paul. Paul was a skeptic. He was killing other apostles. He had authority with a letter from the synagogue in Jerusalem, or the temple in Jerusalem, to kill believers who follow Christ as the Messiah. They could stone them under um, Jewish law. And that was his role until in Acts 9, um, Jesus himself appeared to Paul, right? So big. that's a big point here. Um, now think about it also, this. You would never include the phrase that's, that's here in this section of scripture that there's 500 witnesses unless you are absolutely confident that these folks would confirm that they really did see Jesus alive. I mean, think about it. Paul was virtually inviting people to check it out for themselves. He wouldn't have said this if we, he didn't know they would back him up. Look, you know, we'd all love to have five sources for this, you know, extra biblical and and whatever, and a thousand other extra extra copies throughout secular history. But uh, we do have one excellent source that we can trace, a creed that is so good that a German historian, uh, Hans von Kapranensen, say that really quick, this account meets all the demands of historical reliability that could possibly be made from such a text. The creed is early. It's free from legendary contamination. It's unambiguous and specific, and it's ultimately rooted in eyewitness accounts, right? So Peter, that's from Gary Habermas himself. I was talking about his book earlier that, that he's writing. Um, he's an uber doctor of theology. So, okay, so let's review, all right? So the six E's, six E's, execution, empty tomb, eyewitness accounts, the early accounts, Emergence of the church in the early creed. That's that's uh, that's what we just went over. So, summary. The resurrection is mentioned or alluded to over 300 times in the New Testament. It was the main point for each sermon in the book of Acts. Right? Think about Peter and the apostles. When they started, what would they talk about? The death and resurrection of Jesus, right? Furthermore, there is no forgiveness for anybody's sin. For those who have died believing in Christ have no hope. If hope in Christ is limited to this life, Christians are to be pitied above people, right? Right. So, another point, Jesus' bodily resurrection confirms his claim of being Christ, the Messiah. Right? So, with this, with the sake of time, I want to open this up. Let's talk about questions. What questions do you guys have?
But just uh, to add, add to the uh, testimony, uh, I forgot in which book it was, but I know that uh, one of the disciples asked about the town where Jesus got resurrected. And even at that point, before the resurrection, he says, no, I don't want to go there yet. This is not the time. So he was very clear of what was going to happen and, you know, the resurrection and the crucifixion and that as well. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah. yeah. That was kind of the precursor to what my question was going to be, is that I, the way I've always understood is that there were many who didn't recognize him. And he would be standing, you know, with them. And I have a hard time understanding. I have a hard time understanding that. So maybe what Chris was just talking about kind of answers that question. It wasn't time yet. Mm -hmm. Right. When thinking about it, the the the, per, the epitome of that is the road to Emmaus. When we have the two apostles that are walking along, they're walking away from Jerusalem. What did Jesus tell before that? Think about it before his betrayal and the night in Gethsemane. Right? What did he tell him to do? I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to die. Crucified. I'll be resurrected. Meet me in Jerusalem. The two apostles are being disobedient. There, Jesus had to go find them. Right? Come on, boys. Come on back. Hey. Right? Now, it's not explicitly drawn out in the text, but that's what was happening. When they were going to Emmaus, that is going away from Jerusalem. So Jesus went after his boys because they were out creating a ruckus kind of thing. It's a great question. It's very true. And I think that I think his the reason he hid himself, now this is conjecture. This is totally conjecture, but I think it's simply the fact that um it allowed him to have conversation with them where they processed it. You know, because for me, I'm a I tend to process things. It takes me a while because I'm slow. And so uh when he's telling, you remember, what did he say? Starting at Moses and all the prophets, he explained how the Messiah must die for the sins of the people, right? He he gave them the gospel as it started way back in the first part of the, in Genesis, right? So uh, I think that him being, again, conjecture, him being hidden from them allowed them to process through some of that because he did reveal himself. When did he do that? When he went to break the bread for the communion, remember he said at the Last Supper, I will not partake of this with meal with you again until we're in our Father's kingdom, right? And so when that point came in the mealtime, I think it's kind of cool how the epiphany of everything came to that point with those two apostles, and then he disappeared. So does that, make, does that answer your question, Susan? It's a great question, actually. That's why I like this. this. is one of my favorite parts of all the of all the classes when we just get to talk. Patricia, um, oh, I'm sorry. Pat, are you trying to ask a question? Yeah, I, I have a problem with my Catholic friends when they believe the Bible is written by man, and like I try to tell them how prophecy, if it was said before Jesus and even the the crucifixion, you know how he be crucified on a tree and not a bone will be broken and it's just I get frustrated when I can't get through so then I said to my friend I'm speaking the truth and love and you know ask other people don't just go by my word ask somebody mm -hmm. you respect that that knows you know philosophy whatever but this is a big uh, hindrance with people that are Catholic I mean I grew up Catholic but <clears throat> My friends that are, that's the big argument. I don't know how to break down the argument. I know why I believe what I believe, but I don't know how to get them to open their eyes to see it. What, would anyone else like to answer that? Please. <laughs> yes, please. Yes, please. Yes, please. Um, physically, I can understand what they mean because God himself didn't come down, get paper and pen, didn't write it down. I think the best way to answer that in my perspective is it was half written by man, half written by God, because it was inspired by the Holy Spirit, which is still what the Catholics believe in the Trinity. So it was the Holy Spirit that, that influenced the writing of the Bible, but they just used man as a tool, just as you use tools like for a scissor to cut paper. Man was the tool, but God was the author. Uh oh 
Does that make any sense? All right. Uh, I'm looking for an actual Bible verse here. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, which is important, but by holy men of God as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Right. So this is this is actually uh, apologetically um, is is critically important because this is a common atheist viewpoint. It was a book written by man, and therefore it's full of errors and redundant. Da, 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 da. But the the proof of burden is upon them. It's upon them to prove that there's fault or failure in it. Right. And it's actually interesting. There's an atheist um, skeptical view, uh, website where they say there's these lists of these contradictions in the Bible. And it's so interesting because there's a Christian website that says, wait, 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 that isn't what happened. And that isn't what it says. And they're, they're all, they're all make, they make up stuff. They literally, they're, they're not sound arguments. Number one, yeah, Pat, they don't read the Bible. And number two, so, but it's sad because people kind of look at those things and go, see, I agree with that. You know how some people will just see a Facebook post and they um, th they'll forward it, and they don't read the article. You know, uh, this is this is what's happening in politics, or this is what's happening with masks and COVID and vaccinations, and they just pass it on and put it on their their Facebook wall, but they haven't even listened to it, right? And that's a lot of what happens with skeptics who are um, they they don't want to do the the due diligence and the hard work of proving their own point, like you guys are. You guys are amazing. You're here going. You know, Lord, speak to us, feed us, give us wisdom, right? This kind of stuff comes from the Spirit. It's not me, right? It's not the material. It's led by the Spirit because Jesus said, apart from him, we can do nothing, right? So think how much more nothingness can anyone do unless they're saved by the Spirit of God. You know what I'm saying? But kind of ranting. Yes, Pat. Well, I just feel like when, I, when I'm trying to tell somebody and they're not getting it, that I've planted the seed and then somebody else will come along and water it, mm -hmm. that I shouldn't be so frustrated. You know, I'll have one conversation where somebody gets it and then a couple of days later I'm talking to somebody else and I can't get through to them at all. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that kind of like I lose where I kind of like won a battle. It's, you know what I mean? Like an enlightenment, not a battle. Mm -hmm. But I, I say to myself, well, you know, it says that our burden is only to share the gospel, but God's the one that makes it grow, you know. That's right. Amen. So I, I just pray that with my ski friend, Paula, that <laughs> she will talk to somebody else or somebody else will say something like what I said to her already. And then she'll be like, oh, I heard that before. Yeah, uh, I'll get to you in a second, Chris. Just one, one other point that I would I would add to that. One of the most powerful uh, apologetics for the Bible is the Bible, actually. And that, I'm not saying that to be trite. What I mean is um, prophecy bears witness to its authenticity, right? Think, think of that. Prophecy bears witness to its authenticity. Um, there are over uh, 200 prophetic references to Jesus in the Old Testament um, easily, which 20 of them clearly he fulfilled that he had no control over, like where he was born, what time he was going to be born, how he was going to die, right? There's, there's this irrefutable amount of information that requires that something supernatural existing outside of time must have orchestrated the Old Testament. Now, if somebody's skeptical of the Old Testament, they go, I was just written, blah, 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 blah. And, um, it's full of errors. It's also copied. Then why are documents that are over 3,000 years old matching up to what's in the New Testament and our current versions of the Old Testament through the Dead Sea Scrolls? Isaiah scroll in the Dead Sea uh, Scrolls, which was found in 19, I think, 48, around 48, 47, that actually, those scrolls, talk and they have the same it's 98 99 percent the same as the versions of the old testament we have and those one percents that are different are synonyms in transliteration issues that's it there's there's nobody there's nowhere where it says that you know the messiah is 
isn't going to appear. There's nothing that contradicts what I'm trying to say. So the fact that the Old Testament authentically points to a Messiah and that Jesus fulfilled those prophecies speaks to the inerrancy of God's word and to the validity of Jesus as Savior. Does that, does that make sense? And, and, there's, and we can give you some resources, too, that actually walk through the prophecy being fulfilled is the validation. And the likelihood of that happening accidentally is, is hysterically incredible so anyway okay chris you had a you had a, your hand raised up yes i was gonna say i think that's amazing and i'm very proud of patricia for doing that and i saw a lot of people were saying as well that we must be planters of seeds and of course this is true but jesus also says he commands us to go out and be fishers of men he doesn't say hey you can he says go out and share my, my word across all the nations so we, we must be fishers of men and you know Try, try to get as much people as we can and bring them to the Lord. And, of course, the planting of seed will then come into effect as well, where the Lord will finish his work with them. So it's important to realize both parts of it. It's two different parts. Amen. Amen. Yeah, we have our work to do, and we should do our work. Um, but likewise, um, the, the Lord, Dan actually said it well, John six forty four. no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. God has to draw those individuals. But at the same time, we are agents of God's. We are ambassadors for Christ. There's a duality there. It's not either or, right? We just like the Old Testament prophets and priests, you know, the, the Bible says we're going to be prophets, priests, and kings. And we have that um, shadow fulfillment now of being priests of the gospel with people, not priests in terms of anointing or a religion, the priests in terms of um, a people who are called by God to declare his glory like a priest does. Make sense? Yep. Um, can I can I uh, say something real quick? Well first of all I don't I don't know you I don't know your name because it doesn't show it says Calvary Crew volunteer. My name's Curtis, sorry. <laughs> Curtis. Thank you so much Curtis. Uh, I did take notes. I don't I'm not a note taker but I definitely want to start studying the Bible in this way. And this is a perfect place to start, I think, uh, as far as as far as far uh, the focus of Christianity and our, our faith and, and the one true God. But uh, my, my question would be, and I think Patricia nailed it on the head, is like, um, I've met people when you would tell them, no, it's irrefutable that, you know, there's, there's, there's so many accounts, there's so many eyewitnesses, there's a ton of ev evidence of, Simply the fact that Jesus Christ was an actual person. He actually existed on earth in history. It's written. Like, you can't change history. And yet, they would refute that um, simply because they want to be ignorant and they want to be arrogant. And um, really, I guess they, they're propping up whatever belief system they have and calling it my truth, my truth, my truth. But mm -hmm. the truth... Um, I guess my question is, how would you approach people who are, you know, too stubborn for their own good, in a sense, in in, in this kind of, uh, in this in this kind of topic? Uh, there's an easy answer, <laughs> and there's a difficult uh, answer. the The easy one is you you just have to love on them and wait for the Holy Spirit to soften them up, right? Um, and Pat I, I brings up the good point. C.S. Lewis, he was a skeptical late into his life, very much beyond skeptical, right? Mm -hmm. Love him through it and then answer questions along the way or ask them questions. Who is Jesus? You know, was he mythical? But, but that isn't what the historical record says, you know. Mm -hmm. Where did how did we get the Old Testament? Right? Put the yeah. put the burden on if they're gonna argue it, they have to support their side. If they're going to say the Old Testament is an error, the New Testament is an error, they have to prove it. That, that that's lazy athe atheism. Kind of thing. Does that make sense? I hope that helps. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I think agree. Uh, especially what you said about the burden of proof is on them. Mm -hmm. um, that makes perfect sense because we're not trying to convince you uh, with evidence that God exists. Uh, it, it, it takes faith. And then the evidence will come. 
there's that leap of faith that God exists. They're like, I don't, I don't know about God. Uh, you know, there might be something out there, something in, in the ether, something bigger than us, and it has some sort of power. But it, it's like it's we're not trying to prove. We're, we're trying to show the love of God. We're trying to evangelize, um, not through like hard facts. Like here, here's the picture. This is, this is exactly what he looked like. Like that's not, you know, it, it's the wrong approach essentially. But uh, it's like you said, you have to love on God, and mm -hmm. and yeah. Right. The, the burden of proof is 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 key. Like if they want to make an argument, um, support yeah. it. Support, support your argument. Can I say something? I'll try to be quick. Sure. Yes. Please. I there's there's a there's a popular quote. I think it's by Saint Francis of Assisi. Um, uh, Preach the gospel and when necessary use words. Mm. Um, some of the people that I've wanted the most to to quote unquote get it um, when it comes to scripture and God and who he is and have a relationship with him has been my own family. And of course, you know, it's it's harder to those are probably the hardest people to minister to. Um, and God has convicted me, you know, early on in my walk to not, you know, not uh, hit them over the head with the Bible and not you know, be hammering this kind of stuff on them all the time. Um, and I don't even, and I live thousands of miles apart from them, but um, I've gone through a lot of stuff. And um, over the years, they've noticed how God has carried me through and they've noticed how so many things, you know, I, I cannot be attributed to myself. It's, it's, it's him doing all these miracles. Um, and that has brought them really closer and to seek the Lord um, for themselves. Um, and God, uh, this this um, Christmas gifted me <laughs> with the time to go visit them, uh, first of all. But then also he opened the door for us to have a conversation because they wanted to talk about it. He spoke for for uh, um, uh, Christmas Day about just Bible and and how it, rela it relates to things that are going on today and all these things for like five hours. Wow. And then we picked up on 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 the conversation on New Year's Eve and talked about it some more. Mm -hmm. um, just just I just wanted to bring that up to just encourage you guys. Um, you know, keep praying. I've been praying for my family about this since like 2013, 2014. Um, and he is at work. He is at work. That's it. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Thank Amen. You. That's great. That's very encouraging, Morelli. Thank you so much. Thank you. Right. I'm going to let Dan wrap this, this se section of the questions. Up. Okay. I just had a couple of things to share. Um, one was with, uh, with Dallas Jenkins from uh, The Chosen. He says, a special a favorite quote of his is, it's not for us to feed the 5,000 just to supply the, the loaves and fish. <laughs> and another thing um, is we ha you basically have two kinds of unbelievers. You had the skeptic and you had the cynic. The skeptic will, I'll believe it when I see it, or give me the proof. A cynic, forget it. That's, you give that, you give that one, you give him, that person to the Lord. Let the Holy Spirit do the work. And you, all you can do is pray for that person. I agree. And actually, sorry to jump in, Dan, but mm -hmm. Jesus said as much when he said, "Don't throw your uh, pearls before swine." And I think that there are those individuals where. We're frivolously wasting our time speaking with them and just say, hey, I'm going to let the Holy Spirit deal with you, you know. And then there are people who are, you know, I've had friends in my life that are skeptics, that they just, they genuinely have questions and they're willing to talk it out as long as, as long as they're reasonable. But there's no point in trying to reason with the unreasonable. You know? I think uh, there, I think there's more people who are, are the skeptical kind of the variety than you know the cynical so i guess prayer is, is very very important in those terms but one last thing i just i just wanted to say based on what 
Morelli said, um, you know, living a Christian life, uh, that example is the seed that you plant in all those people around you. Um, and, and something I've always said is like, even somebody who is introverted um, has influence around the, uh, over the people who, um, that are, you know, exist around them. So just your mere example is, is a seed um, of, of your testimony that you are successful, that you can be, that you have hope, you have faith, you have this, this happiness and this peace that God, only God can provide. And I can, I can go on and on. There's testimonies I can, I can share, but, um, just want to thank you guys so much. This is excellent. Well, I, I, I gotta, I gotta jump on doctrinal point here. Cause, uh, Alex, what's your first name? Histro? Harista, Harista. Which age? Okay, I want to be sure and get that right because you and Morelli, you're hitting on a very profound biblical principle. And I want you guys to write this down because I think it's the Holy Spirit stirring it up. It's Revelation 12, 11. Revelation 12, 11. So the, this is in, it's happening in heaven from a biblical perspective. And it's talking about um, the, the saints that are there, right? And it says that the saints have overcome Satan by the blood of their lamb and the power of their testimony. So what you guys are both saying are proven by the proof text, the, I'm sorry, not proof text, the proof of the word in Revelation 12, 11. They will overcome Satan, his, his attempts, his works, by the power of the blood of the lamb, which comes first, and by the power of their testimony in a transformed life. So yes, absolutely. Um, that what you guys are speaking yeah. is I want to also put in the comment section here as we're closing up. This is my email. I think I spelled it right. Yes, that's my email. So the window will close when we're done with the meeting. But if you guys want to copy and paste that into some other format now, now's the time to do it. Um, if you have not attended a doctrinal class before and would like to get on a mailing list for that, just copy, paste it, email me. I'll be glad to do that. Or if you guys have any questions specifically that you um, – um, uh, would like to talk offline, you guys can email me. I love getting stuff like that. Morelli works with me here at Calvary, and she knows that um, uh, I love love um, talking about doctrine, apologetics, and all that kind of stuff. So here's my, some of you may not know my name, and that's my name and my phone number, all right? And that's my extension here at work, so you guys can get a hold of me. So I know, and I just want to say, you know, guys, thank you so much. I so love spending this time um, with with the groups, and it's, I'm I'm trying to work down <laughs> the time so we have more time um, uh, in Q and A because uh, usually this happens we go over long in Q and A, but like with this, there's so much information. It's so deep and rich. So I thank you for your patience. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your heart to learn. Um, you guys energize me. You really do. This is one of my favorite parts of the month is, is when we come together and hang out and share God's truth. And as iron sharpens iron and everyone contributes and, and discusses and shares their testimony and what God's showing them, we grow. This is the way the body of Christ grows. So thank you guys for your time. Thank you, Curtis. Uh, my pleasure. My pleasure. So let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father. Lord, I thank you for these godly men and women who you have called for such a time as this. Lord, it is clear that you are active and alive in their hearts and minds through the power of your spirit. Lord, you stir them up through your word to draw them close to you. And Lord, I pray a continued anointing upon them that they will hunger and thirst for righteousness, to know you and to make you known. And Lord, to be fed off of the living word, the bread of life. So Lord, um, I pray a continued anointing upon them until we meet again, whenever that time may be, Lord, that they will flourish in their faithfulness with you and bear much fruit for your kingdom. And Lord, we offer this time to you. And Lord, I say, Lord, if, if I've spoken anything that is foolish or of the flesh, let it quickly fail and, and fall upon the ground in deaf ears. But, Lord, those things that you want us to retain and remind us of, Lord, let them find deep, fertile ground in our hearts, Lord, that we may walk in a way that pleases you. 
So, Lord, go before us. You are our Savior. You're our Redeemer. You're our Rescuer. And, Lord, we anxiously look forward to our resurrection, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Curtis. This was great. And if I may, I just want to add one other thing to tie both evangelicalism together and testimony, um, especially according to what Miss uh, Morelli was saying. And she's just an example of what we can do actually in the world by being the light that we are in this world. And just by doing this, the world will be curious of who we are and say, hey, why are you so happy? What are you so happy to be proud of? We're in a pandemic, blah, blah, blah. And we say, hey, we have Jesus. And that's another opportunity by just being the light to evangelicalize. So it's two birds with one stone, as they say. Yeah, what are we told in Nehemiah? The joy of the Lord is our strength. Amen. Not the joy of my financial prosperity, not the joy of my social status on Facebook, not the joy of my power and title at work. The joy of the Lord is our strength, including times of pandemic. Yes, sir. And thank you for recording this, because I know some classes they don't record, so thank you for this. Yeah, thank you for everything. If you email me, I'll send you guys the link. If you guys, some people like to go back, and when I send out the link, I'll actually give you guys the presentation link, and you can see my notes because as detailed as this is, I can't make it up. Or you know, hmm. but all the notes are in there, and the sources also. Because if there's something you want to go deeper on, sometimes there's links to other sources. So you can, if you have somebody you're having a discussion with, you can look on that presentation and um, uh, do a little bit di deeper diving. Thank right. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, well, thank you guys. God bless you all. All right. Bless you all. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you. Go to church. Good weekend. Go to church. Yeah, we will. We will. Bye, <laughs> Chris. Bye. -bye. Uh,